Hello everyone. I think we're going to try something a little different today. We're going to take a look at Elite Dangerous, the space sim from Frontier Developments. We're going to talk a little about why I like it and why I don't. And with the new expansion, Elite Dangerous Horizons, coming up, I should be more hyped than I am. And I'm going to talk a little about why I'm not. So before I get too much into that, I'm going to start by going through in sort of chronological order, talk about the state the game launched in, the patches that have come out since, and the state the game is currently in, and then the future state when Horizons drops in the next month or so. So the first thing I want to talk about is the, way, the launch state. And this brings me to my first criticism of Frontier. They have a tendency to bring things out of beta and call them official launches, too early, before they're ready. And this happens nearly every single patch, arguably every single patch, and it will likely happen again in the future. And it's something that you get tired of after a while. And I think that's a big contributor to why I'm not quite so hyped about Horizons as I would like to be. So 1.0 launched without a number of features that people would consider sort of essential or important or very much looking forward to and expecting to be in the base game. For example, party play. There was no way to party up with other players or co-op with your friends. There was no political or map control or anything along those lines. There was no balanced uh, team combat. And there weren't that many ships, among other features. These are a few of them. And these were all added in later on in patches. So, you know, good job Frontier for that. However, there were still some issues, and there still are some issues with all of these things. So patch 1.1 added something called community goals. Community goals are great. They provide players with a reason to go to certain places in the galaxy and perform certain jobs while they're there. Now this is a really nice way to get people to try things out they might have otherwise overlooked or dismissed because maybe they weren't worth enough money or maybe they just didn't seem that fun. And here you're offering a monetary incentive and a gameplay incentive by bringing all these players together to get them to try something different, and that's cool. I like that a lot. 1.1 is the patch that I started playing on, admittedly towards the end, so I never played on 1.0 the launch stage. 1.2 added one of the most requested features of all, and that was party play. It was called Wings, and it allows players to get together into a wing of up to four people. Now, Wings launched with a few problems as well. I think they pulled that out of beta too soon because there were all kinds of instancing issues right off the bat, where invites wouldn't go out, or if they did, you still couldn't see your own friends. You'd both fly to the same place, but be unable to see each other, because you were in different instances. That's largely been fixed, but there are still two other problems that have not been addressed. The first is information sharing. Two ships in a wing should be able to share information very efficiently, and in some cases they do, but in some cases, where they ought to, they still do not. Now an example of this would be bounty hunting. Before you can shoot anyone, an NPC or a player, legally, you must point your ship at them and wait for it to perform a basic scan to determine legal status. If it comes back wanted, you're free to fire without consequence. Otherwise, firing on uh, a clean target will give you a bounty on your own head. And then the police will come after you and try to kill you. Now, if I'm in a wing with a friend, and we're bounty hunting, and I scan a ship and determine that he's a wanted pirate, a wanted criminal, my friend's ship should know that immediately. He should not have to perform that same basic scan that I just did. However, he does. Now, this leads to a simple problem where I might call him for help, say I'm not doing so well in my fight against this pirate, and my friend turns, he sees the ship clearly shooting at me, and he opens fire before waiting for his own ship to perform that basic scan and confirm wanted status. Well, now he picks up a bounty on his head for defending me, and despite the fact that he was firing on a wanted target when his ship should have known that, and it interrupts our night, as now he has to leave the system or risk fighting the police for the next two hours. The third one about wings that kind of still bothers me is income splitting. Now this affects combat roles more than the other jobs out there, but, if we take out a target together that's worth 100,000 credits, we have to split that 50-50. Now, if there are four of us in the wing, we split that four ways. This would be okay if the game compensated by giving you 
enemies that were harder and worth more credits, or threw more enemies at you to compensate for the number of players working together, but it does not. You'll still find the same number of enemy pirates or enemy wanted criminals, and they'll still be about the same difficulty and worth the same amount of money. So instead of getting any kind of advantage out of playing with a friend, all you do is cut your income and your progress rate in half or worse. I think that needs to change because it encourages players to not play together, to play on their own and just talk over TeamSpeak or something. I think that's very poor. So on to the next patch, 1.3. This was called Power Play, and this addressed the concerns, or at least tried to address the concerns around no endgame content and no political uh, content, no agency, the ability to affect change in the game world. And a lot of people were really hoping that Power Play was going to add depth, something that is sort of sorely needed. And this goes back to the mile wide, inch deep thing. Power Play, hopefully, at least the idea that people had in their heads, was going to give you a reason to go and do the different activities and to leave your home system where you were comfortable, to give you a reason to care about why you were doing this or that job or helping this faction. But it didn't really do that. Instead of adding more sand to the sandbox, it felt like Power Play added a second, separate sandbox, and you could only play in one or the other, but not both. Power Play doesn't even reward you with money, not directly at least. All of the jobs you do are essentially the same as the regular careers, but you're rewarded with something called merits instead, which eventually can earn you some money, but requires significant time investment to do so, and more or less earn about what you would make just doing the regular jobs in the first place. So in many regards, most people think that power play was a bit of a failure in that it didn't bring any added depth or incentive or anything to the game. It just added a separate sandbox to play in for those who have more money than they know what to do with or more time than they know what to do with. One point four, patch one point four, brought something called close quarters combat. Now this is the arena shooter mode, and this addresses the concerns around PvP. Now PvP in the base game is sort of punishing. Your ship can be worth a lot of money, and your rebuy, which if your insurance costs if you blow up, is five percent of your ship's value. That means if you're in one of the bigger ships, the Python or the Anaconda or something along those lines, your rebuy is easily five, ten, or even fifteen million credits. Now that's a lot of money. To put that into perspective, the highest income rate in the game, not counting power play, which, as I said, kind of cancels things out because of the time investment required, the greatest amount of money you can earn in an hour with the largest ship in the game is about 10 million credits. If your rebuy is 15 million, that's an hour and a half of doing trading on, a, on the most efficient route possible for an hour and a half to pay back the ship that you lost in three minutes of fighting some other player. So how many times do you think the average player can afford to rebuy their ship? How many times do you think they can afford to lose it? Not very many. And this leads to another problem where dying is so expensive that players do something called combat logging where they either yank the ethernet cord or kill the process, causing them to simply disappear from space and keep their ship. This is really a poor sport kind of thing to do, and it only happens because it's so punishing to explode and to lose your ship in this game. So CQC in 1.4 was added to address this. And it's an arena shooter, with, it's fast paced, it's varied, it has lots of different modes, it has matchmaking. It, in that regard, it's a success. It does that very well. But CQC suffers from similar problems to power play in that it feels like yet another separate sandbox tacked on and you can only play in one or the other. And with CQC, that's literally what it is. It's even worse than power play, because CQC isn't accessible from, say, your ship menus or from a docking port or anything like that. The only way to get there is to go from a separate main menu option. It has no bearing on the game. You cannot earn any kind of money related to your main ships. You don't carry your ships over between the modes. It's a totally separate game. So most players, and they boot up Elite Dangerous, they think, I could work on earning that next ship that I want, or I could go and do some bounty hunting, or I could play this totally separate mode that has no impact on the rest of my game whatsoever at all. 
As a result, CQC is not that well populated. The last one, as part of this first season or year of content, is patch 1.5 called Ships. And it adds exactly what it sounds like in the name. It adds a whole bunch of new ships, including a couple of bigger ships for those players with, again, more money than they know what to do with. So that's cool. I mean, that's a really good thing. But again, on the downside, it doesn't add depth. It doesn't add motivation. It doesn't give us a reason to do or to care about the things we're doing. It just adds more ways to do them and more things to save for. So yet again, I think Horizons, or I think um, Frontier has missed the mark in the development focus. And instead of focusing on giving us reasons to do these things and reasons to care, they've just given us more stuff to do that is empty and kind of meaningless. And they keep doing this over and over. There are some things that the patches have added that have been really, really good, and I would like to commend Frontier for those. Among others, there have been improvements to different careers, such as mining and smuggling. Both have become significantly more profitable, and mining has seen all kinds of new technologies added that make it way more interesting and way less tedious. So, good for that. That's really good. I'm, mining was actually quite interesting the last time I did it. It still doesn't make you much money, but it's a lot more enjoyable than it was at launch by far. They've also made some improvements to the system map, which helps explorers dramatically, which is nice. And there's been some mission improvements, although I still don't think they pay out well enough, and I don't think they scale up well enough. There's some things that most players agree have not been addressed by the patches that they would like to see addressed, and this has gone so far as players have asked Frontier to stop adding new features for one patch and just focus on... Sorry, stop adding new activities and focus on enriching the ones we have now and bug fixes and performance and whatever else. So some of these things that have not been addressed that players would like to see are the background sim, which is not that complex, and this is in regards to the economy. There isn't much to it. You can't do much to change it or to affect it or impact it permanently. Everything sort of resets after a few hours. And there are all kinds of little, little things like there is no difference in the cost of your commodities based on the distance of the station from its main star. Whether you drop out and the station is 200 light seconds away and you get there in a minute, or it's 300,000 light seconds away and it takes you 20 minutes to get there, there's no difference in what things cost or what it's worth to sell at. So there's no reason to ever visit these stations that are far away. And that's something that could have been added and shouldn't have been that difficult. One of the main features that everyone has been requesting since beta that is still not in the game and isn't confirmed yet as far as I'm aware is system bookmarks. And this would be really, really nice, especially for explorers, but everyone would make use of it. The ability to flag a system that you've been to and give a little explanation about why it's cool, why it's important, or why it's significant. And then you can always go back and look through these and see, okay, this is where there's good bounty hunting, this is where there's a good trade route, this is where there's a really cool four-star drop-in or a tight binary or something like that. But right now, the only alternative you have is to buy a Sidewinder, which is the ship in the game, and park it there. And then you'll get a little red indicator on your map, and then it's up to you to remember why. Or you can open Notepad or get a pen and paper and just write it down. Now, if your players are using third-party tools or pen and paper or whatever outside of the game to accomplish something that they're frustrated by, this is a good opportunity for you to make something, to add a new feature to your game that does it better. But so far, it seems like Frontier has missed that mark. There's another one for explorers, and that would be a system log. When you get back from a trip, from a big exploration trip, the only way you know how many systems you visited, where you went, or anything like that, what was in those systems, is whether or not you wrote it down or took screenshots along the way for yourself. There is nothing that you can go and look and see a trail through the galaxy of where you were, and I think that would be incredibly cool. Another one for mostly explorers again, but everyone could make use of this, traders, uh, rare traders, manual route plotting. The only way to get anywhere now is to select a destination and then choose either the fastest route possible, or the most economical, where it'll try to do it in many, many jumps, but to save you as much gas as possible. And that's it. You can't just kind of shift-click your way through or control-click your way through, right? And select a bunch of different stars that you want to visit in that order. 
which would make things much easier for people farming neutron stars or have a set route, a trade route that they do, and always want to visit the same places. That's another one that would be useful for traders, is the ability to define a loop and not have to keep reselecting your destination. As it is right now, bulk commodity traders primarily fly from station A to station B, and then from station B to station A, and then they repeat, and that's all they do. And every single time they have to reselect their destination, there is no way to create a permanent loop that the ship can just follow forever. One that I would like to see is ice rings. They're still pointless. There is no reason to visit a ring of ice around an ice planet unless you want to take a pretty screenshot. And after a while, that gets tiresome. It makes me wonder why ice and water are not resources. They would be important. I mean, there should be plenty of stations that are having trouble finding water. It reminds me a little of Ender's Game. When I read that as a kid, there's a part where they encounter the Formix, the alien race they're invading, who are mining ice and water from an, an ice ring around a planet because their home world has run out of water and they don't know where else to get it from. Why isn't this happening in Elite's universe? I think it should. I think it would be excellent if we had a reason to visit those beautiful ice rings, but currently we don't. And finally, one of the things that still hasn't been addressed by patches is the sort of reliance on the random number generator, RNG. And the solution to many things ends up being log out, log back in, check to see if something has changed. Log out, log back in, check to see if you got what you want. Now this applies mostly to mission runners, but also to bounty hunters and smugglers and miners. If you don't get the mission you want the first time, you log out and log back in and it'll reset the mission board and maybe there'll be something better. And you just keep doing this until you get the one you want and then you go and do it. That's not gameplay. That is not enjoyable. That needs to go. That needs to be fixed. It's even worse for bounty hunters who get to this, it's called a resource extraction site. It's the most popular place for bounty hunters. When you jump in, the spawn table might be all small pirates, small ship pirates in little tiny ships that aren't worth much, or medium, or large, or some mix therein. And to get a spawn of all large ships, which are worth the most money, is very rare. And it, you'll have to log out and log back in to reset the instance an average of 15 times before you get that. So this is even worse with party play. Because now you're telling your three friends, okay, you guys hang out here and wait while I log in and out 15 times until we get big ships spawning. That's not fun. That's tedious. And it makes friends not want to play this game and go play something else instead. So I want to talk a little about the incomes for the various jobs and a little bit about the disparity between them and why people do them and why they don't. Some good things about them, some bad things about them. And I'm kind of going to go in roughly most to least profitable order here. But overall, the kind of the point I'm trying to drive home here is that even the people who claim they are only playing for fun, they do whatever they think is the most fun and they don't care about the money, Everybody has a number, and at some point, the difference between the income and the job you enjoy and the income and the job you think is tedious gets so great that you end up doing the tedious one because it's the only way you feel like you can make any progress. So, trading is your most profitable venture, by far. Bulk commodity trading requires a large ship that can carry hundreds of tons of cargo, and it's largely just finding an efficient route between two stations and finding two commodities that are worth a lot of money to the other station. And all you do is fly back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now this is often compared to Euro Truck Sim or something along those lines, but people will be quick to tell you that it's not quite the same. In Euro Truck Sim there is more to it. The city routes are different, you're driving around in cities, you have different destinations in the cities all the time, you're given missions and different kinds of cargo, there's different traffic, there's different conditions and weather. It's always varied when you do these little runs back and forth. In Elite, commodity trading is the same every single time. You load up on whatever cargo, it doesn't matter what it is. You fly to the other station, you dock, you pick up a new kind of cargo, and you fly back. And that's it, and it doesn't change, and there's nothing different. There's a reason people call it Netflix Simulator. Most traders have Netflix open on a second monitor because it's the only way they can handle the monotony and the tedium. However, because you can pull in with a big enough ship up to 10 million credits per hour, 
it's very much a I'm going to do this until I have money to do the things I want to do, such as PvP. Remember what I talked about earlier about how expensive it is to lose your ship. So if you want to do PvP, the fastest way to get back into it is to trade for a few hours. Now there's a form of trading for smaller ships called rares trading. And this is picking up a small number of tons of rare cargo and hauling them a great distance to sell for huge profit margins. This is great for small ships. It doesn't work in big ships because you'll never find enough rare material to make any money. So it's a great thing for new players, and I think this one's honestly in a really good place. It's somewhat enjoyable. I mean, you're doing a loop, but it's a big enough loop that you're visiting lots of different places. And it's, you know, it's, it's a good place. I think that one is fine the way it is. I like it. Next we have smuggling, which is another form of trading, but you have to be kind of sneaky when you're getting into the stations and do it without being scanned. Now, you can do this both ways. Uh, you can do it kind of like bulk commodity trading, where you're just going A, B, A, B, A, B. But the one people really enjoy is where you take a mission to do a, sort of a long haul, much like the rares trading, but it sends you all over the place. Instead of following a map, or instead of following a loop, you're going wherever the mission sends you. Now, this is more like your truck simulator. And this is what people are really enjoying. However, in 1.5, this the income from these is getting nerfed significantly. It's almost like Frontier is saying, you can have fun or profit, but not both. And I don't get it. The next career is combat. Now, combat is in a really poor place. There are lots and lots of different things you can do combat-wise to make money. I think there are seven or eight or whatever different kinds of combat activities, but only one of them is actually worth your time, and that's Resource Extraction Site, because it has the potential to earn you up to three to five million credits per hour. Now, notice that's still half what you can make by trading. And it's tied to random number generator. Remember when I mentioned earlier about logging out and logging back in until you get what you want? You have to do that if you want to make 3 to 5 million credits per hour bounty hunting. If you don't, you're looking at 1 to 2. A tenth of what you make trading. And trading doesn't have the reliance on RNG. Now there are other things you can do in combat. There's conflict zones, which are fast-paced, high-risk. They're a lot of fun, but they don't pay out very well. You're making a very consistent to 2.5 million credits per hour. And the big problem there is that the value of the targets you're fighting doesn't scale with their combat rank so or their risk level. So an elite target, the basically the deadliest target in the game, is worth the same as the same ship with a harmless rating. So why would you ever go after the greater challenge when killing one a weakling version of the same ship is worth exactly as many credits? So this is a little disappointing. It means conflict zones are high risk. You like you stand a very good chance of wrecking your ship and having to rebuy for 10 million credits. And you don't make that much money, and it doesn't scale at all with the risk you're putting yourself in. You're better off finding low-risk targets and just killing the little guys because you make the same amount of money. And that's encouraging the wrong things. Now there are combat missions combat missions are fun, more or less. They take a long time. They take 45 minutes in many cases, and they span several systems, and you're often hunting for certain targets or killing a number of pirates, but they don't pay out very well. You're looking at anywhere from 30 to 100,000 credits for most missions, and you might say, well, that's great for new players, and that's it, but there are missions that are not accessible until you have a very high combat rank, so you must be a millionaire by this point, or even a billionaire by this point, and even the high-ranking missions are still only paying out 400,000 credits, aka what you make in three minutes of bounty hunting in a resource extraction site. So most players say, well, why bother? Why would I do that? And I mean, the answer is because you enjoy it. You know, you have to enjoy the missions to do them, but after a while you start to think like this 400,000 credit reward is barely paying for my insurance. It's not paying for my insurance. It's barely paying for my ammunition and my repair costs. I need to find something else to do that will help me make some money and get out of the ship and into something bigger. And that's where you end up with players who go into trading, whether they think it's boring or not. 
There are other kinds of combat I could talk about, but it's much the same story there. It's either too risky for not enough reward, or the reward is just so pathetic that it's not worth your time unless you're role-playing and they're doing it for fun and really do not care about how much money you make. And I think most people, on some level, do care. They, they, don't, they aren't happy in the starter ship forever. They would like to move up into something different, maybe try something else, and the only way to do that is to make some money. Next, there's exploration, which I'm doing right now, and this is an interesting one. Exploration is one of the lowest income activities in the game. The only way to make any money is to head to the core and farm neutron star fields, because they're the only thing that's really worth anything. I mean, you'll notice right now that I'm not scanning. I'm not even scanning the main star when I drop in. I'm simply honking to scan the system and then leaving. Because scanning the main star is, in general, not worth the time it takes. Now, normally I do this because I really enjoy it. I like exploring. I'm curious about what else is out there. I'm, I like to find interesting systems with strange combinations of stars. But right now, there's something motivating me, and that's a community goal that's back in the populated area of space. The reward, if I manage to get there in time, will be something like 30 million credits. Now, I've been exploring since August 1st. I have been out for months and my reward for just turning in this exploration data alone will likely be about 30 million credits. So I'm effectively doubling my income just by heading back a little early and rushing to get there. Something is kind of wrong with that, I think. That I have been out for so long and I'm, this little event that goes on for a couple of days can double my income that easily. The biggest problem with exploration, however, is that there's no real incentive to leave the drop-in point. When you drop into a new system, you scan the main star, you look at what else is there, and if there's no Earth-like, no water planet, and maybe no ammonia world, you leave. There's all kinds of cool stuff, these crazy ringed gas giants and all kinds of interesting combinations of things, but there is no reason to fly to them. The scan is worth a few hundred credits at best, and you can't land on basically any of them. And even with Horizons, which is adding planetary landings to certain kinds of planets, you won't find anything. They're dead planets, there's nothing on them, there's no reason to go down there. So unless you want screenshots or video content, most explorers kind of scan the main star and leave, because there's no other incentive for them to stay or to do anything. And that makes 400 billion stars not seem like that many. Because once you've seen a few, there's no reason to go and really explore what's unique about them. And so they start to all feel the same after a while. It's either no Earth-like or has an Earth-like, and that's kind of it. Finally, the last... Well, I guess there's two more. There's mining, which I mentioned a little earlier. Mining has come a long way. It's still not that profitable. I'd like it to be more profitable, more attractive, because it is... it is neat. I liked it a lot. The last one is piracy. Now, this is an interesting one. Piracy is kind of the definition of you don't do it for the money. Piracy is the only meaningful interaction with other players. There is no real reason to interact with another player other than to either blow them up or steal from them. And that's kind of it. Like, there's nothing you can really do cooperatively without nerfing your income for both players, so they often choose not to. So piracy is extremely varied, depending on all kinds of factors. It's the only real player-player -player interaction. But you don't make any money, even if you're successful and you're not dying and you're stealing cargo, you have very high ammunition and repair costs because you're constantly in and out of super cruise. You're very likely to lose your ship and you're only getting a couple of tons of this and that at a time and you might even have to smuggle it in before you can sell it. So pirates make just enough to cover their costs. In general, they don't really make any progress at all. They do it because they like the player interaction. So that's kind of that's the majority of the different incomes. And I think I mentioned that, you know, the difference between the most and the least profitable is so great that people, even people who insist that they only play for fun, stop playing for fun and start playing for the reward because it's the only way they can make any progress. And that needs to change. So finally I want to talk about the New Horizons expansion that's coming out. Now, I already mentioned what it does. It adds planetary landings for airless moons and planets. And it's expensive. It's 
$45 if you own the base game. It's $60 US if you don't, or, or if you're buying it at full price. And the big concern about it is that what happened with all of the previous patches is going to happen again here. Frontier is going to take it out of beta before it's finished, and it's going to launch missing many of the features that it promises. For example, multi-crew is promised. Multi-crew will not be in Horizons at launch. I am extremely excited for multi-crew. I love the idea of getting two or three of my friends together, pile into the Anaconda, and go exploring or go visit somewhere together. That sounds like a lot of fun, but it won't be in at launch. So why do I want it at launch? I don't know. I don't. I want to wait until multi-crew is there. The same goes for character customization. That's promised as part of Horizons, but it won't be there at launch. So it's a matter of waiting. Is it going to be one month or three or six? Or will it not show up for 11 months for at the end of the Horizons season when they're already asking for money for the next one? I also worry that multi-crew won't. It'll be much like Wings where it's kind of disappointing and almost punishes you for playing together with friends. Will it be interesting for the second guy? If I'm flying and shooting, what's he doing? Changing my engine pips? Changing my shield strength? That's not exciting. That's not engaging. They need to improve the depth of sh the ship's onboard systems to make that worthwhile, and I fear they won't. And I'm going to have to wait a while to find out whether they're going to or not. One of the biggest concerns, I mean, Horizons is in beta now, so there are players who are playing it, is that it doesn't address the problem of depth, like all of the patches before it failed to do. So currently, right now, we have all these different activities in space. Horizons adds versions of many of these activities on the planet. It adds an equivalent to many different things, but it doesn't change or affect the ones we have already, and it doesn't seem to add any incentive or reason or to care and the payouts seem to be horrible. There was a wing of players, of four players, who assaulted a medium security base on the surface with their expensive ships that are worth hundreds of millions of credits. For example, a single anaconda uh, spec for combat can be worth 800 million credits or more on its own. And they assaulted this base using these big ships, which they required, and their reward was 30,000 credits. That is nothing. That is insulting. It is pathetic. It is terrible. And it has to change. But it won't. And we know it won't. So once the novelty wears off of, hey, this planet looks really cool, I'm going to go and land on it and take some screenshots, it'll soon become, hey, that planet looks really cool, but I have absolutely no reason to fly all the way down there and land for nothing. So I'm just going to keep on moving. Once the novelty wears off, what else is there? And that seems to be the question that Horizon or that Frontier hasn't answered yet. So overall, I like Horizons. I, or I like Elite Dangerous. I think it's an enjoyable game. I love just flying the spaceship around and shooting things and exploring the galaxy. It, it was well worth my money to buy, and I've sunk many hours into it. And I will probably continue to play it. But I'm not hyped for Horizons. I. I love the idea of planetary landings and character creation of multi-crew, but I know, based on watching the last several patches, that it will launch too early and incomplete, it will take several months to add the promised features, and it still won't do anything about the features that we've been asking for since beta, or to add reasons to care and reasons to do different things or add depth to them. It will continue to feel like yet another sandbox tacked onto the existing one, and you can only play in one of them at a time, but not both, or not all of them. So thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed my rant at least somewhat, or got something of value out of it. If this is well received, maybe I'll do more in the future. Cheers.